go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to make sure, and speaking on this amendment again, um, and while I, I respect the intent of trying to acknowledge uh, the, the historic moment and the historic ruling that is before us and before the Supreme Court, I want to reiterate the sentiment that Mr. Raskin and, and Ms. Tlaib expressed because there is a reason that our government is designed that the way that it is, and it is because it is designed to acknowledge the flawed human nature in our grand experiment of self-governance. Unspeakable horrors have been executed by the United States in the name of citizenship, in the name of determining who is a citizen, and by citizen we mean who is a person in our democracy. That is what citizenship means. It is an acknowledgement of personhood in American democracy, an acknowledgement of power. And when I think about Supreme Court decisions with this, I think about Dred Scott. I think about Korematsu versus the United States where the Supreme Court upheld Japanese internment regardless of the, of the citizenship status of Japanese Americans. And how did that start? It started with the United States Census. It started with the United States Census. We have laws on the books saying that information from the census cannot be used in any other way, that it must be confidential. And what happened when the, when the federal government, the executive branch, the president of the United States, I don't care if he was a Democrat, I don't care if he was a Republican, it was wrong. And what he did, he asked for information, and the Census Bureau broke the law and divulged information on zip codes where Japanese Americans were concentrated. And that information was used to intern American citizens and non-American citizens alike. And the Supreme Court upheld that. Dred Scott, a black man suing for his freedom, came right, right before the United States Supreme Court. And what they said was that the U.S. Constitution did not give African American citizenship. They have gotten it wrong. The Supreme Court has gotten it wrong. And unspeakable violations of human rights and civil liberties have been executed by the United States government in that, in light of that. And I can tell you as, uh, with this Supreme Court argument, they could very well get it wrong again. And I don't even want to think about how far that could be pushed. But that is not even what the question is at hand today. Because what this subpoena is about and what this contempt is about is the fact that we have asked for information and there is a refusal to comply with a co-equal branch and our power. That's all that this is about. That's all that this is about. And so we have to execute our power and hold that power to account and vote on contempt. So the reason I do not want to support this amendment is because I don't want to muddy our waters. I want to make sure that we are laser focused, that we are effective, that we are efficient, that we don't add any bloat and we do not confuse people as to why we are doing what we, are need, what we need to do. We are, we are voting on contempt because we need to do our jobs and people are refusing to comply and because we have given no choice. Regardless of what's being held in front of the Supreme Court, regardless of what's happening in the executive branch. We need to do our job, and that is what this vote is about today. General Lady, yield. We'll put General yes, yield. yes I'll, I'll yield to the chairman. <laughs> the, um, your statement about the Japanese internment camps is so real. I don't know if you noticed, uh, it's an article in the paper today, I think it is. It says that the Trump administration is now using those same uh, camps to put uh, immigrants and people trying to get into our country, mm -hmm. uh, and children. Um, and I just wanted to say that I, when I listened to Mr. Raskin and I listened to our arguments and then I heard Mr. Jordan say, he suggested that the true purpose of the amendment is to be able to argue that we are interfering with the Supreme Court. Uh, I don't want those, I don't want that muddled either. I want, mm -hmm. I, I want our committee to do what our committee is supposed to do. I want our Congress to do what it's supposed to do. And I want to preserve the power that the founding fathers gave us in their wisdom. I do not want it diluted. I don't want it power light. 
I don't want, I want the full power of, that the Congress is supposed to have, and so I'm not going to be supportive of this, okay? Uh, who else? Who's next? Chairman Cummings? Uh, Mr. Uda. Thank you. I'd like Uda. to speak to the, Uda. Uda. Uh, a few things. Uh, I'm a freshman. I had never run for office before, before coming here. And my message was that most Americans are between the 20-yard lines, that we have a lot more in common than what separates us. And one of the most poignant moments in my journey here was when I raised my right hand uh, with my eyes welling up and taking an oath to the Constitution of the United States of America. And in taking that oath, we're not taking an oath to a party. We're not taking an oath to a president. We're taking an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America. And I take the issues we are facing here today and, and appreciate the enormity when we are contemplating uh, this resolution with uh, Secretary uh, Ross and Attorney General Barr. And I wanted to study and look and try and find information and support as to where I should land on this. And I also wanted to look at the pros and cons of what I see as the major issues. With the first major issue that we seem to be talking about a lot is executive privilege. And I don't think anybody in here thinks that the White House and the administration have absolute unbridled uh, executive privilege, that there should be limitations on the exercise of executive privilege. And in fact, I actually agree with the chairman of this committee who said the executive branch has executive privilege. It's narrow, it's well-defined, there is case law. If you do not find a legitimate basis to deny us material we've asked for, we will seek the remedies necessary to compel. And I can't agree more with past Chairman Issa and the Republican side of the aisle in making that statement. I agree. Those are appropriate statements regarding executive privilege. I also take exception with the ranking member's comment about the Democrats, why don't we want to know who is a citizen? The reason is because we already know. We already know through administrative functions, such as Social Security, who has citizenship in our country. But don't take my word for it. The Census Bureau's chief scientist under the Trump administration, Dr. John Abowd, wrote to Secretary Ross that, quote, Adding a citizenship question to the 2020 census is very costly, harms the quality of the consensus count, and would use substantially less accurate citizenship status data than are available from administrative sources. But don't take his word for it. Six former Census Bureau directors who served in both Democratic and Republican administrations sent a letter to Secretary Ross opposing the addition of the citizenship question. We also seem to be taking a lot of time talking about the volumes of pages that have been delivered to the committee. They've been non-responsive. This is no different than receiving a book from Amazon that you didn't ask for and them telling you to read it instead of the one you ordered. We deserve to have the documents we have requested given to us. There was a statement that this is a vast and nefarious conspiracy uh, in the belief of Democrats. Uh, for me, nothing could be further from the truth. I do not think this is a vast and nefarious conspiracy. I think it's a nefarious uh, group of individuals within the administration who are trying to do harm to our census, which leaves me thinking that the speaker said it correctly. No Justice Department above, is above the law. And no Justice Department is above the Constitution, which each of us has sworn to uphold. I could not agree more with Speaker Boehner when he uttered those words. The question I'm always asked as a freshman is, what's the biggest unexpected thing you have come to see in Congress? And for me, it's the hypocrisy. It is the hypocrisy when we have all taken an oath to the Constitution. And... That oath should stand firm. It should not be swayed by political winds, by polling, or who is in office. That oath must stand firm. And I would ask that all members in this body reflect on staying true to the oath you took, regardless 
of the party in power. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Do we have any further discussion? Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor, does not mean. The question now occurs uh, on the amendment offered by Mr. Meadows. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. Aye. No. The noes have it. For the roll call. Roll call. We will uh, suspend the vote until uh, the roll call until uh, we take all the other votes. Yes. Yeah, it's an amendment in the desk. Mr. Gibbs. Let's pause for a second and get it distributed. An amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by Mr. Gibbs of Ohio. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is just really a, a simple amendment that I think should be included in the resolution. So when we talk a lot about uh, uh, historians, but how about the average American? When this amendment passes out and they want to read the, the resolution, and when the resolution passes out, they see what's in it, and it's, I think it's important that we documented some facts. The fact that the Attorney General has produced uh, over 17,000 documents in response to the April 2nd, uh, 2019 subpoena. The fact that the uh, uh, Deputy Assistant AG, John Gore, voluntarily appeared before Chairman Cummings at his request for a transcribed interview to March 7th of this year. And I think it's just important to, for the average American who reads the resolution to know the other side of the things that happen and, and, and have that transparency and to show that the administration has been forthcoming on, on the, uh, some of these requests. And uh, I think it's good for the historians, but also for the average American. And I urge all of my members of the committee to support this amendment That's a, just to document the actual facts that's happened and it'll be part of the record in the resolution. I, I um, disagree with this amendment. It basically um, is not accurate. Um, not uh, the responses that we've gotten have not been responsive. As has been stated already, uh, most of the material uh, was redacted. Um, a number of pages, I mean, I, I can't count this, uh, uh, quite a bit of it was already in the media. Um, and the very things that we really wanted, we have not gotten. And we've asked for it over and over and over again. And so I would oppose the amendment. Yes, Mr. Sarbanes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for yielding. Yeah, I oppose the amendment as well. I mean, if you look at these sort of two-sentence amendments we've been getting over the last few hours, they strike me as attempts to kind of normalize bad behavior. And we're not going to be complicit in that kind of a narrative here. I mean, we had the um, Supreme Court one. That's kind of a distraction because it's was pointed out compellingly that's really irrelevant to what we're doing here. We had this thing about when and how the citizenship question has been um, presented uh, in the past, which is sort of to make it look like it's harmless um, to put it in there when we know that it can be extremely harmful. Um, and then this latest uh, amendment, which again, tries to just kind of normalize everything that's going on. I want to play it as straight as possible here. There's two real sources of anxiety I think we have. The first just has to do with the question itself. 
So forget about the motivations for a moment. We have evidence, we have expert testimony that if you put that question on the uh, survey, on the census survey and questionnaire, it's going to have an impact of an undercount in the millions. And we know how important it is to get an accurate count. I think some of these statistics have already been quoted in the hearing, but I'll, I'll restate them um, if they haven't been. 320 federal programs relied on census data to distribute over $880 billion in federal funds in FY 2016 alone. 55 of those went directly to rural communities, and the federal government distributed over $30 billion specifically to rural areas in fiscal year 2000. 16. Then we could sh show the impact on urban communities for not getting these counts right, on school systems who depend on the Title I formula for the funds that they get as to why it's so important to get the number right. So even just leaving aside whether you had concerns about the motivation behind the question, putting that question on there, there's just absolutely no question the impact it will have. And it's our responsibility to make sure that the people are heard, that their power is represented through the census. So that's one legitimate source of anxiety that I think we're bringing to bear. The second is the concern over motivation. Because the evidence, and this is why we're trying to get more, the evidence is that the Trump administration is actually looking to weaponize the citizenship question for political gain. That's, that's the deepest anxiety. And then you put the two together. You know the impact it will have based on what the experts are telling us if you include that question. You then have enough evidence and suggestion that the motivations behind putting the question on there are insidious. You put those two things together and no wonder we're as concerned as we are. No wonder you're taking all the steps you are to try to get to the bottom of this and get good information. Because Americans need to be deeply concerned if there's a campaign underway to take this question, weaponize it in a way that is designed to diminish the, the power, the presence, the voice of certain communities across this country. And all we're asking is we want to get to the bottom of it to make sure that we're doing our duty and fulfilling our responsibilities to the people of this country that we are asked to do every, every 10 years as part of this census. So that's playing it as straight as I possibly can in describing why we have the anxieties we do. And I'll yield back. Gentlemen, gentlemen yield to me. Uh, let me just say this. Uh, Mr. Sarbanes, uh, this morning when I left, uh, Baltimore at 5.30, at 5.30 coming to D.C., I saw people getting the early bus. They were the maids. They were the people who uh, take out the trash. They were the janitors, the restaurant workers. And, you know, I, I said to myself, you know, when they get their, their uh, stub at the end of two weeks of the paycheck, they see a lot of taxes taken out for them. And the least we can do is make sure that they get what they are due. In other words, you, making your point, when it comes to the census, if we don't get it right, that means that they are being denied the very funds that they have put out there and they need it the most, need it the most. So, and we're talking about 10 years. It's not a year, it's 10 years. That kid that was one year old now, in 10 years is 10. That's a lot of years. And a part of that kid's life being deprived of those things that we're talking about, education, healthcare, all of that, they're denied. And that's why you're right. You're absolutely right. We have to get it right. We got to do it. Who's next?
This question now occurs on the amendment all, um, offered by the, who's, Gibbs. Mr. Gibbs. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Aye. No. The no's appear to have it. We will record that vote later. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I have an amendment. Mr. Chairman. What are we going to do? Their side or our Gomez. side? Gomez. Gomez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I feel like people forgot how to take turns around here. You have an uh, amendment? Um, I'm in support okay. of the okay. amendment. And the reason why is that the census, as everybody mentioned, is, is a big deal. It's been used throughout our history to either empower or to marginalize communities because it has an impact on apportionment, government resources, you name it. It is the fundamental building block of our country. So what we're trying to discover is, did this administration decide to marginalize or empower? I believe it's marginalized. And because of our investigations, they have started a strategy of dodge, delay, and deceive. They dodge questions when they come before our committee. They delay providing documents or witnesses to uh, when we ask for them. And then they deceive Congress and the American people about the true intentions and motivations of adding this question to the census. Yes, I know, originally we were told that the Department of Justice wanted more census block data on citizenship so they can uh, enforce the Voting Rights Act. But yet, the Voting Rights Act has been enforced since 1965 without a problem. Now they have a, now it's an issue, highly unlikely. And later we discovered it wasn't the DOJ making the request originally. What they did is they first, Department of Commerce went and asked DOJ to submit a request to add the citizenship question, but they didn't respond. So they went to other departments trying to get them to ask. So if it was really the Department of Justice asking for it, then why are you shopping around for departments that will uh, enforce and actually do your do, uh, dirty work? So. When we keep looking at it, it just shows that there's something not right in their, in their arguments. Um, and when it comes to the last amendment, they basically used John Gore came before the committee on March 7th. Well, he didn't answer not one question, not two questions. He refused to answer 150 questions before the staff, 150. If you're an open book, then why are you dodging so many questions, because that's what not, they want to hide their true motivation, right? Let's go back, last week, the committee staff released a memo describing our, uh, our transcribed interview with Chris Kobach, after the Department of Commerce accused Chairman Cummings of lying, but the memo was accurate. The memo described how Mr. Kobach, who is a GOP, voter suppression specialist had proposed a draft citizenship question to Secretary Ross and explained his rationale. He wrote, the lack of a citizenship question, quote, leads to the problem that aliens who do not actually reside in the United States are still counted for congressional apportionment purposes. Secretary Ross testified before this committee that he, quote, rejected the question that Chris Kobach wanted. But Mr. Kobach, had a different recollection. In his interview with the committee staff, he said that about Mr. S uh, Ross, Secretary Ross, quote, well, I don't recall what he said. I could say this. If he had said flatly, no, I don't, whatever, you know, I think that's a bad idea. I probably would have remembered that. So I, I think his, and I don't remember his specific response, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't, you know, absolutely no. Well, that's, that's pretty clear. Clear. Of course, Secretary Ross ultimately did add a citizenship question, and that question matched the one used on the American Community Survey and differed only slightly from the one Mr. Kobach proposed. Let me show you the two versions of the question up on the screen. Well, if they, once they get it up. Come on, you guys. Nope. If the, my, my point is, if the department has nothing to hide, it's a simple way of proving it. Stop withholding documents. Stop doing the dodge, delay, and the deceive, because we know where this will end up. 
My, the folks on the, uh, on the other side of the aisle, my Republican colleagues say, it's all about history. And I want to tell them something very clearly. History will show that they're on the wrong side of this issue, simply enough. And with that, I yield back. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Palmer. I have an amendment at the desk. Please distribute the amendment. So, Mr. Coleman, please speak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a simple amendment that basically states the, the fact that the Secretary of Commerce has produced over 14,000 documents responsive to the April 2nd subpoena, including on June the 3rd. Uh, just so it, we can be very clear, the Commerce Cabinet has made two senior officials and one former official available for voluntary transcribed interviews, including one yesterday. The Commerce Department and Justice Department have produced over 31,000 pages of documents, including a document production from Commerce on June 3rd. And there's also already an extensive public record of the issue from the Commerce Department's decision-making process and the various lawsuits that liberal special interests have brought. Mr. Chairman, I could go on and on uh, with other facts that I think everyone on the committee knows, including the fact that the Trump administration has produced already over 93,000 documents for 2019. But in the, for the sake of time, I would just move approval of, of or adoption of my amendment, uh, basically stating the facts of what the Commerce Cabinet has done to comply with, with this committee's request. I'm, a, I'm vehemently against this amendment. The question now occurs on the amendment by Mr. Comer. Mr. Comer? All those in favor, in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Aye. No. The no's have it. Mr. Chairman, I ask for a recorded vote. Very well. We will postpone that until later. There being no further uh, amendments, recorded votes on the pending amendments have been postponed. Once those votes are taken, the committee will immediately consider the motions to adopt the amendment in the nature of a substitute as amended, if amended, and report, uh, report the measure. Right. Now we'll go to the next Mr. Lynch. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Lynch. Uh, Ms. Chairman. Yes. Down here. Oh, oh okay. Yes. I, I was waiting to strike the last word on the All contempt right. bill. All right. Uh, let's recognize her out of order. All right. Uh, I mean, I, I don't mean to need to jump in front of Mr. Lynch. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, please. Are you sure? I, I just wasn't sure where we were in the no, order. No, go, please. Okay. Thank you. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this administration consistently has seemed to think that following the law has some kind of optional drop-down menu that allows them to pick and choose when they follow it. Heeding Congress's requests for information is not optional. Today is really all about there being consequences to those actions because no one is above the law. Subpoenas are not optional. 
The Constitution is not some real estate contract the President can treat like it's not worth the paper that it's printed on. This committee has worked painstakingly to get answers regarding one of the most fundamental components of our democracy, the U.S. Census. We must get to the heart of why, after 70 years, this administration, 70 years, would add a question to the census asking every American whether they are a citizen. I don't need to reiterate what every member of Congress in this room knows. This question is untested, unnecessary, and will result in a less accurate census. In fact, earlier in this hearing, I underscored that the reason the Census Bureau discontinued use of a citizenship question is because it contributed to an undercount, the exact opposite of the goal of having a census required in the United States Constitution in the first place. In fact, <laughs> we recently learned that it is very likely that producing a less accurate census is exactly the administration's goal. Recent court filings show that Republican gerrymandering expert Thomas Holfeller, as we've heard, advised this administration that adding this question would, quote, be advantageous to Republicans and non-Hispanic whites. The goal is clear, undercount immigrants, undercount communities of color, and deny fair funding and representation to the communities in which they live. This is quite simply a diversion of democracy. This administration is working to weaken communities like Miami-Dade County and Broward County, both counties which I represent, to ensure they have less political power and less federal funding for our schools, roads, and other public services. Including a citizenship question turns the U.S. Census into a tool of marginalization when it should be a bastion of representative democracy. This administration has failed to produce requested documents, defied subpoenas, and interfered with this committee's investigation in a coordinated effort to avoid transparency. And Secretary Ross sat here and lied to us straight up lied to us when we asked him direct questions. And even with the redacted, ridiculously blacked out information we've received so far, that is clear. The Trump administration may be abdic abdicating their duty to serve the American public, but this committee is not. And we will vote today to uphold the sanctity of our nation's laws and seek to avoid the man manipulation of a sacred constitutional foundation of our democracy to be counted. Thank you. I yield back. Will the gentleman yield? Oh. Yes, my time was not expired, and I do yield. Thank you. Um, I just, I wanted to make two points. Um, one is that all of us in politics like to win. It's been, I've noted that it's kind of in the general personality type of people going to politics, that people are kind of competitive. They like to win. Okay. But I've asked myself the question, would I seek to win an election, Mr. Chairman, by suppressing the vote, by purging voters from the rolls? I went up to Ms. Ocasio-Cortez's district and to Ms. Maloney's district. We had a, a hearing of the Civil Rights, Civil Liberties Subcommittee up there about the census. And while the Secretary of Commerce is involved in this whole business about trying to paste a citizenship question on the census that didn't go through any of the normal channels or administrative process, he's neglecting the real duty in his job, which is to see that the census actually works and people don't know about it. And so I think that everybody on this panel, everybody in Congress should ask the question, does victory mean that much that we would actually risk undercounting the American population by six million people? Does it mean that much to us? I yield back to the gentlelady. Thank you very much. Thank you, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Now, pursuant to notice, I call up H.R. 391, the White House Ethics Transparency Act. The clerk will report the bill which was distributed in advance. H.R. 391, to provide transparency Transparency regarding waivers granted to individuals from the ethics requirements of Executive Order 13770 or any subsequent similar order and for other purposes. Without objection, the resolution is considered read and open to amendment at any point. The chair recognizes himself to offer an amendment in the nature of a substitute. Copies of the amendment have already been distributed and are on the desk. The clerk will report. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 391 offered by Mr. Cummings of Maryland.
Without objection, the amendment is considered read and will serve as the base text for purposes of amendment. I now recognize Mr. Lynch for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. As the sponsor of H.R. 391, the White House Ethics Transparency Act, I'd like to thank you for your work in moving this legislation forward. I'd also like to thank Representative Sarbanes of Maryland for including the text of my legislation in, into H.R. 1 for the, for the People Act, the extensive campaign and ethics reform package that passed the House in March. In the interest of maximum transparency in government, H.R. 391 would require that the Trump administration and all future administrations to promptly disclose all waivers of executive branch ethics pledges that every political appointee is required to sign as a condition of their employment. The bill would require any executive branch official who issues a waiver when potential or actual conflicts of interest arise to provide a copy of that waiver to the independent office of government ethics within 30 days. It would also require the public posting of the waiver on the Office of Government Ethics website and the website of the issuing agency. Given the absence of timely and complete information on waivers issued by the current administration, the bill is retroactive to January 20, 2017. During Democratic and Republican administration alike, executive branch ethics pledges have been put in place to better ensure that the important work that senior officials perform in the White House and other federal agencies on behalf of the American people is not controlled by the undue influence of private industry, previous employers, or foreign government lobbying interests, where waivers are issued allowing key personnel to depart from their binding ethical commitments and participate in matters that as formal lobbyists, industry attorneys, or consultants may present significant conflicts of interest. It is the fundamental right of the public to know that those conflicts exist and when and where, when and why the waiver was granted. The current ethics pledge was established by President Trump himself by Executive Order 13770 in January of 2017. Common sense dictates that the administration that has pledged to, quote, drain the swamp, close quote, would make every effort to avoid industry influence and welcome every opportunity to inform the American people about who precisely is working behind closed doors in the government. Regrettably, that has not been the case. According to the public interest investigative organization ProPublica, President Trump had already hired nearly 200 former lobbyists in the first year of his presidency. They included Lieutenant General Michael Flynn, who performed extensive lobbying work to advance Turkish government interests before his tenure as National Security Advisor. In March of 2017, a spokesman for the Lieutenant General uh, confirmed that, quote, he never had an opportunity to sign the ethics pledge, close quote. During his 24 days on the job, that same month, he retroactively registered with the Department of Justice as a foreign agent. Yet despite the steady influx of special interest personnel into the executive branch, the Trump administration initially blocked all requests by the ethics office to disclose its waivers at all. While the White House has since committed to providing waiver information on its website, it has remained resistant to the ethics transparency by failing to disclose waivers in a timely manner, issuing vague blanket waivers to groups of ex-lobbyists and releasing waivers that are undated. As reported by the nonpartisan government watchdog organization, Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in, in Washington. The absence of dates raises the serious concern that some waivers may have been granted retroactively. That's after officials had already worked on matters involving their former clients or employers. The White House last updated its public list of ethics waivers nearly five months ago. As a result, we still don't know the full extent to which waivers have been granted to key White House officials, such as senior advisor to the President, Jared Kushner, whose financial interests and previous private sector employment would seem to present a myriad of conflicts of interest with his White House portfolio, as detailed in the recent majority staff report on the administration's efforts to rush the transfer of nuclear technology to Saudi Arabia. Mr. Kushner's family's company received a significant cash infusion in August of 2018 when Brookfield Asset Management agreed to pay the rent up front on a 99-year lease for the family's, the Kushner family's debt-ridden 666 Fifth Avenue project in New York. 
only a few months prior to the deal, which the New York Times characterized as removing the family's biggest financial headache, a Brookfield subsidiary had announced its plans to purchase Westinghouse Electric for $4.6 billion. Westinghouse is a bankrupt nuclear services company that stands to significantly benefit from the developments of nuclear reactors in Saudi Arabia. In his executive order on ethics, President Trump acknowledges that the political appointees are, quote, invested with the public trust, close quote. By requiring the administration to timely and publicly disclose all waivers allowing the president's appointees to bypass executive branch ethics pledges, we will be able to better preserve the faith of the American people that their government is working for them rather than outside interests. So I urge my colleagues to remember this is important to our collective oversight responsibilities. Someday, I'm just reminding my Republican colleagues, someday there'll be a Democratic president. And at that moment, I'm sure you will rediscover your obligation to conduct oversight. This, this change will help the oversight function of this committee. I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to support H.R. 391, the White House Ethics Transparency Act. I thank the chairman for his indulgence, and I yield back the balance of my time. Yield to the gentleman, the ranking member, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, H.R. 391 is word for word from H.R. 1. We asked for a markup on H.R. 1, but the chairman said no. Today, we shouldn't pretend after we've already voted on H.R. 1 on the House floor that we're going to go through regular order. But here we are again, marking up parts of H.R. 1. Politicizing and weaponizing the Office of Government Ethics means creating another way for Democrats to attack the Trump administration. And that's exactly what this bill before us today does, targets the current administration. President Trump's executive order, number 13770, requires every presidential appointee to sign an ethics pledge. Appointees can obtain a waiver for any restriction contained in the pledge. H.R. 391 would require these waivers be posted on the employing agency's website and the Office of Government Ethics website. Making these ethics waivers publicly available is a good thing, good for government transparency. However, this administration already makes this, these ethics waivers available. This bill is clearly not about transparency. This bill is about targeting the president and his administration. H.R. 391 requires previously issued waivers be made publicly available, but not all previously issued ethics waivers. The bill only requires transparency for ethics waivers issued since January 20th, 2017. Imagine that is right. The retroactive applicability of the bill highlights the true intentions Democrats have for this legislation. Let's only get this information for the last two years in this administration. Seems to me, if we're going to pass this, let's just pass the bill like any other bill. It'll become law, and then it's applicable to this administration as it moves forward and any other administration that's going to be in office in the years to come. Or we can make it retroactive for everyone else. But no, no, no. Just since January 20th, 2017, this bill is yet another tool to harass the president. I urge my colleagues to oppose the legislation. Mr. Chairman. And I yield back. Mr. Raskin. Wait, could I just say, um, President Obama voluntarily posted ethics waivers that were issued under his executive order, so they're already available. But so is Mr. Trump. Do, 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 I take, do I take the gentleman's point to be, if we make it fully retroactive going back through the Obama administration or back to the beginning of the ethics laws that he would support the bill, because in that case, I would amend to do it. I think we should do legislation like we're supposed to. I assume the gentleman's asking a question that we should do legislation like we're supposed to. We pass a law. It is then the law, not retroactive, but the law from that point on. And as you point out, the Trump administration is also making these available. Yield back. Yes, I'll yield to the gentleman from Massachusetts. Uh, I thank the gentleman. So. It was, just so you, 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 the gentleman, the ranking member is painting this as a, as a Democratic versus Republican thing because there's a Republican in the White House. But I, I want to just for, I ask unanimous consent uh, to submit a letter from Senator Charles Grassley uh, of Iowa. And uh, it is 
in this letter dated June 11, 2009, that uh, Senator Grassley urged the White House to make, and at that time the Obama White House, to make transparency and ethics waivers uh, and recusals public. So uh, this is exactly what we're trying to do with the Trump administration. The difference here is that when President Obama got the request, he responded to it and made them public. That's not what we're seeing from the Trump administration. His last posting was incomplete. It was back in January, uh, five months ago, and we still have individuals in the administration that we know have conflicts, that, but yet there's no, there's no waiver indicating that, that they have been uh, allowed to engage in the activity they're currently engaging in. So that's the difference, that, that Obama made it public, he posted it, it was uniform, it was widespread, and he was accountable. The Trump administration is not doing that. They are making him public. They're posting him too. Well, the gentleman. No, yield. I'll be claiming my time. Uh, you didn't yield your time. Right. So, so here, here's, here's the deal. They're not disclosing the individuals. They're just saying groups of employees, without naming the individuals, have been given a waiver. They're also undated, undated. So they go retroactively, I, I guess, back and give waivers to people who have already been lobbying in the area where they used to be employed. And the Kushner situation is really troubling because he has a portfolio that covers Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, and, and other countries in the Middle East. His, his family's business was at the verge of bankruptcy. A Middle East company uh, comes in and basically prepays the lease. So they, they get a 99-year lease on the Kushner family property at 666 uh, Fifth Avenue, and they prepay the lease for 99 years up front and bail out the Kushner family's pro property. Would the gentleman yield? Sure. I'm, I'm looking at the list now. From this administration, James Ayers, Michael Candazero. Here's the name you probably know, Pat where's, Cipollone. Wh where is where's Kushner's name? Can Kelly you start with that one? Does Kellyanne Conway work for the White House? Certainly. You said there where, was no where, individuals no, there. No, 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 no. I, I said it's incomplete. And, and I don't see Kushner's name Daniel here Epstein anywhere. Epstein works in the White House Counsel's Office. Pat Cipollone runs the White House Counsel's Office. Reclaiming my time. I don't see Kushner's name here. I don't see it. He's, he's a special advisor to the president on Middle East affairs. He's, he's also receiving direct benefit. And, and, and by the way, he didn't divest himself of his interest, his direct interest in that property I'm that's now being bailed out. Gentleman yield? Uh, not at this time, no. Um, I yield to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes. Thank you, gentlemen.